All right, starting the recording. So welcome to the alumni panel. We are featuring three graduates of VDS engaged in different types of work and ministry. Um, we will have the chance for casual conversation afterwards and I'll stop the recording and all of that and you can show your faces again. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to type your questions into the chat box as you think of them. And I'll ask them of the panelists towards the end of the session after they finish their initial um, discussions. I am really delighted to hear from these three because I have not had this conversation with them before. So I'll also be learning all these interesting things for the first time. Um, our first guest is the Reverend Tara Faith Williams, who is an MDiv graduate and is the Executive Assistant of the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and also the Executive Pastor of the New Covenant Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Also have the Reverend Sarah Green, who's a Youth um, and Young Adult Ministry Associate at the Unitarian Universalist Association, and I believe also an MDiv graduate. And the Reverend Matthew, the Reverend Dr. Matthew Kelly, who is an 07 MDiv graduate and is the project manager for LouisConnect.com with Family Scholar House in Louisville, Kentucky, and an ordained elder in the Tennessee Conference of the United Methodist Church. So welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. And uh I am wondering if we could start off, if there's anything else I did not say when I introduced you that you feel needs to be said, and also answer the question, what do you do when you're not on this panel? It can even be beyond your titles. But you're going to have to unmute yourselves. I'll start. Awesome. Um, I'm Sarah. I use she, her pronouns. Um, uh, what I do when I'm not on this panel is really varies week to week, but this week it looks like helping a big national um, office for the Unitarian Universalists figure out how to move people quickly <laughs> to online worship services. Um, and specifically helping religious professionals, religious educators, so people who teach Sunday school, um, figure out how to do youth and young adult ministry without being necessarily in person. Um, so that's part of it. Um, some like crisis management, which is good because I do well. I, I'm a pretty good non-anxious presence, so I do well in moments like these. Um, this week, I also was in North Nashville doing a lot of tornado cleanup. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that because what Lillian said about casting our lot, with whom to cast our lot really was with me last week in the midst of the tornado debris. Um, I have a farm, a sheep farm that keeps me pretty busy. And then I have two foster kids that I soon shall adopt. So those are some of the, the things that take up my time. Um, I'll pass it on. How to, if I can figure out how to work a computer and unmute, yay for me. You're unmuted. Uh, <laughs> so I missed part of my introduction. I think that um, she stated that, I, Laura stated that I am um, executive assistant in equity, actually promote, just recently promoted to administrative manager in equity, diversity and inclusion at Vanderbilt University. Um, and also uh, am um, executive pastor at New Covenant Christian Church with the Reverend Dr. Judy Cummings. Um, so what I do by day <laughs> is my eight to five here at Vanderbilt um, in that role of now administrative manager in equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so I walk alongside the vice chancellor, the interim vice chancellor and chief diversity officer for the university in um, working with groups across campus to kind of um, give best practices and intentionality tools for ways that we can weave the work of EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, into the fabric of who we are here at Vanderbilt. Um, being a full-time employee and a, an alum um, of Vanderbilt, um, you know, I take uh, great pride in being able to say that 
um, I'm able to work in this way to make sure that we are the best institution um, and a leading institution in this work. And so I'm excited to be um, walking that journey with current interim vice chancellor, Dr. Andre Churchwell, who's amazing and does this work well. Um, and then by night or by day and night, or however you want to look at that, um, I journey alongside um, the Reverend Dr. Judy Cummings, who lots of folks know in this city as a um, pioneer for social justice work. And so I do EDI work by day and by night, literally. Um, I serve as the executive pastor there at New Covenant, and so I deal with the day-to-day -day operations and the managing of staff and um, volunteer leadership. Um, as well as um, um, filling in for her as she is out there um, battling daily the social justice platform, um, particularly for the folks in North Nashville right now who were hit heavily and hard by the tornadoes, but were overlooked um, in a lot of ways by media and others. And so we are out there um, this week being a disaster relief center, even though we were hit. Um, and so we've got folks coming in in droves, picking up cleaning supplies and, and toiletries and all the things that they need. Um, so I literally have meshed my two worlds um, of, uh, of the professional um, and the ministerial into really perfect hand in glove positions that kind of walk together um, strategically and intentionally. And so I'm happy, happy to be, be that. Thank you. Matt. Yes, I'm next. So my name is Matt. I use he, his pronouns. And um, so when people hear what my job is, a project manager for a web tool, they think I'm a tech guy. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth, believe it or not. Um, my job is mostly relational in nature. Uh, Louis Connect is a web platform that helps people in need connect with free resources. So uh, when I was offered this position, uh, the site had launched and they needed um, public relations and, and training and being a liaison with nonprofits and churches and things like that. So they basically just looked at me and said, Matt, we need an evangelist for this. And so that is my job. So uh, 90 some odd percent of the time I'm on the road uh, working with service providers, uh, with church groups, schools, police, fire. Um, I basically get to be a kind of chaplain to everyone in the Louisville community who works with people who are on the margins of society. Um, and that's a, that's a community, you know, people in helping aren't good at taking care of themselves. So I'm technically paid uh, for making sure the website gets enough hits and enough trainings and all those things. But the, the ministry part of it is really just sort of that relational uh, piece. And because of that, I, I work with um, uh, I'm on the Suicide Prevention Task Force with the Veterans Administration here. Um, I sit on a number of different boards and committees that, that look at more macro social justice issues uh, because I uh, connect and network uh, between all of those folks. Um, let's see what I do when I'm not doing that. Well, right now, we're in kind of triage mode right now because uh, COVID-19, um, they've canceled school in Louisville for a couple of weeks. And uh, so I've been uh, working the phones a lot with uh, particularly a lot of our free clinics and things like that, seeing if they're expanding hours um, because we really value real-time information uh, on our tool. Um, beyond job stuff, uh, I'm married to Jessica Miller Kelly, who is a MTS grad of Vanderbilt. Uh, she's a senior acquisitions editor at Westminster John Knox Press here in Louisville, which is why we moved here from Nashville about a year and a half ago. Um, uh, we try to keep track of our three kids who are 11, eight, and four, uh, and they're going to be off school for three weeks. So yeah, <laughs> that's going to be fun. Um, yeah, that pretty much takes up all, all my time. Uh, I, I, she's said, I'm a, a United Methodist pastor. Um, you all know that the United Methodist church is, is in chaos right now. So that was one of the reasons we decided to prioritize my wife's career. And for me to, start exploring what it is to be a minister um, when you don't put on a robe every Sunday. And after 20 years of putting on a robe every Sunday, that's been a interesting and often very difficult transition uh, as I've tried to truly live into the idea of, oh, ministry is a way of being in the world. It's, it's one thing to say that. It's another to really try to do it. Thank you all for that, for sharing that. 
Uh, the next question is, what do you wish you had known about Div School before you went? <laughs> it's a biggie. I'll go. Um, I wish I had had a basic, uh, basic index of theological terms uh, because I thought I knew what a lot of them meant, and I turned out I didn't. Um, I'll just give you one example. So on my very first day in a pastoral care class, my first semester, the professor, uh, who is no, long, no longer there, he's at a Lutheran seminary now, was talking about the eschatological nature of something or other with Luther's writing as it pertains to uh, care and tragedies. So this is, uh, this is 2003. This is when the whole left behind an apex. So when I hear the word eschatology, I'm just thinking end time stuff. I said, I was around like, what the hell does left behind have to do with this? And he looks at me like I'm crazy. I wish I had that index of theological terms. No, eschatology was more than some weird end of the world uh, evangelical scenario books. You're muted. There we go. I took the more a practical approach um, to this question. So I wish that I had known um, first that my degree would be used to use more to manage and guide me and my thought processes and journey than to manage or change others. I find a lot of times people think they're going to get a degree because they're going to go out and they're going to do all these great and wonderful things to change the world. And you might. But I found that a lot of it did more about changing me um, so that I can manage my own thought processes and my own journey, which in turn then better help, uh, helps to better manage and direct other people. So that was the first thing. Um, the second thing is that I wish that I had known and really fully understood that I could dual enroll with the School of Law, Owen School of Management, Peabody, School of Medicine, whomever I want to, to make my educational experience exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, yes, there is a path at Vanderbilt, or there was when I came through, I know it's changed a little bit, but there were things that I had to do in order to get on the ordination track and so on and so forth. But there was also an opportunity for me to do some other things with some other schools so that I came out with a total package of what and who I really wanted to be and do. And so I think that's really important. Um, I also came in with what I believed going on, uh, what, I, what I believed um, going in would be totally demolished. And it probably needed to be in hindsight. A lot of it needed to be totally destroyed. But on the other side, that I would become a person with new beliefs and a broader understanding of what it means to be the church. Um, and so, and that comes as you, as I've heard throughout this um, Zoom interview or, or Zoom conversation all day, it, it turns into being more than just, I have to go into the church and do ministry. Um, and then finally, that to embrace every experience, even when it makes you uncomfortable. Um, the divinity journey is not easy. It comes with a lot of obstacles and challenges because life is still happening in the background. Um, as Matt said, with kids, if you have them, with a spouse, if you have them, or partner, if you have one, um, lots of things are happening in the background. So every embrace every experience, even when it makes you uncomfortable. And from it comes great fruit. Um, if you will just lean into it. And, and let it happen. Um, so for context, I think I came from, I came to Divinity School from a small liberal arts college in Vermont. And um, I, I came straight through, so there's no break. So that, that is informing what I wish I would have known. The first thing that I wish I would have known is that I could ask for what I needed. I remember like my last year, and this is also about my identity as like a black woman, totally. Hearing people asking for extensions on work blew my mind. <laughs> and it's something that I, I, it was in like some packet that I didn't get or something, but I just wish I would have asked for what I needed, even if it wasn't listed as an option you know as we're seeing in 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 this week of people like oh you couldn't work from home oh but now you can suddenly <laughs> like asking um i wish i would have done more about um and i think that has to do with 
just figuring out how to navigate a bigger university system rather than like a small liberal arts college. So there was some adjustment periods, you know, I went all of my undergrad degree <laughs> taking only one test <laughs> and uh, there were a lot of tests <laughs> in the first couple of years of divinity school that I failed many times, honestly. So um, that's a whole thing. I also, um, now as a, as a fully fledged adult, have a spiritual director and I'm in therapy, but wow, if that couldn't have solved all of my problems or at least a lot of them in divinity school, because it's not, it's not the like figure out your life program, <laughs> like that is extra, but critical if you want to come out alive. Um, I saw a lot of friends graduate and just kind of feel like a little like lost or like they had to um, recover <laughs> from the experience. And I was pretty certain that I, I did not want to spend time doing that. So I lined up as soon as I graduated, a spiritual director and well, not that but a therapist and a coach you know I had like a team um for accountability and just sorting through my stuff which I would have had much better um relationships and a much better like understanding of how to care for my body and myself and my spirit had I done that earlier um and so to that point there's also lots of things that are sliding scale or virtual that I think would be might behoove you to check out um, and then lastly, the other thing that did not prepare me, or I wish I would have known going in, was that I needed to figure out in the span of three years how to make friends that were not in church or ministry. Um, yeah, that's what I needed to spend more time thinking about. I definitely was in a bubble and I thought that it was helpful in some parts of formation, but um, is sometimes overwhelming as I look around and I'm in like a, a extremely red county, um, just a little south of tennis of Nashville, um, and now I'm stuck in this town <laughs> that I, I I only imagined doing ministry elsewhere from or traveling to other places. Um, so there, there, I think there could have been some more about um, building community that's, that maybe like aren't people that you identify with or agree with. Because at the end of the day, we're in this town together and like in some ways we could be stuck, you know? So those sorts of things um, that, uh, that happened this week, but also lots of other weeks for lots of other different reasons um, could have used some more for forethought, um, certainly in the planning of how I was going to do divinity school and what I needed to be prepared to leave with. Thank you all for sharing. Um, uh, the next question is, how did your education at VDS prepare you for your ministry and work? guess I'll leave this time. <laughs> um, for sure, I would say it opened my eyes to my own problematic and hurtful theologies and ideologies. Um, I think that um, when you come in as a person who is churched, if you will, um, you believe that you've kind of been brought up in all of these different things, and so you've got it, and you know it, and you can step into it. Um, but um, as you work through the work, particularly, again, I know the curriculum has changed some, but just those initial courses that you come into that begin to kind of de deconstruct those ideas and theologies, um, you find out just how problematic and how hurtful you may have been over the course of your life um, in, in, in that. And so you're able to be able, you're able to begin to reshape um, those and so it gave me great insight into how to uh, how to approach people who may be entrenched in their own ideas and theologies that might be hurtful and may not realize it so it kind of gave me that 
um, that background. It also gave me insight into how to navigate and manage um, ecumenical spaces. So again, I had been in a lot of different um, faith traditions. I had been Baptist and Methodist and, you know, flirted with Pentecostal and, and um, the like. Um, but um, in coming into divinity school, there were lots of different um, faith traditions there. Um, you know, Muslim, Buddhist, uh, folks who were undeclared, um, folks who were even declared atheist. So there were a lot of different um, ecumenical um, things happening in the space. And so it, um, being in that space confirmed the call that I had on my life that I would one day pastor an ecumenical congregation, a con ecumenical congregation that not only um, shared the good news and demonstrated the love of God for all people, but would also seek to meet the spiritual needs of all people through ecumenical experiences. And I think that the work that we did there helped with that. Um, because it's okay to believe what you believe, but you need to be able to back it up and then also be open to the beliefs and the experiences of other people. And how can you bring all of that into the room and still be church um, and still be the church? And so for me, um, you know, the work that we did there did that. And it also then provided um, resources and tools for me to be able to do that work. And then um, also gave you some examples like Howard Thurman um, and others who had successfully done this. Um, and so it made it a reality for you because I think a lot of times we have these ideas and thoughts and dreams and we're trying to work it out in our heads of how we can do it and how, does it work successfully and will this work? And so then you get into this space where you have all of these knowledgeable folks who are bringing examples to the table of people who not just yesterday did it but years ago have done it um, and so it makes your dreams um, a reality so again I think um, by removing those um, stupid broken hurtful ideologies and theologies um, in divinity school it was a, I'm, I'm able to do a job here at Vanderbilt um, where you can't necessarily uh, express your full faith uh, or you can, but you need to be mindful that the ways that other people around you experience it and so be able to talk the language in a way that doesn't offend or hurt them um, or feel, make them feel excluded or unwelcome to the conversation. And so I think VDS did an amazing job for me um, in helping me to approach those ecumenical spaces and being able to include everyone, not only at the table, but in the conversation. Um, so the things that I, I learned at Vanderbilt that I'm using today, the first one, um, is how to, how to find my people. There was like kind of a question that we didn't really get to on at the end of the last one about how does Vanderbilt support students in figuring out who, with whom to cast their lot. Um, and I'll let Lillian get back to you about how Vanderbilt supports students. Um, but for one way or the other, I found my people um, in a really busy space. <laughs> um, like also coming from like rural Vermont to Nashville, there's just a lot going on all the time. And um, it was helpful to practice what it means to like focus in on who are the folks that have you um, and are gonna keep you accountable. Um, and that are gonna be life-giving and encourage you to be playful in this work. So I found that at the Divinity School and then some of those people have carried over because they're Unitarian Universalists, but um, I left Divinity School with a, a keener skill of finding my people in the UU faith, um, in the spaces that I was going to. So that feels that feels critical, especially if we're like people of color and a majority white denomination. I mean, there are many identities that I don't share with in a lot of you use. So it was helpful to really know how to say like, oh, like even just like looking across the room and being like, you are my people. And then it's confirmed. So that's one of the things. Um, the other thing, thing is that I am notorious at my job for asking the questions of like finding the radical edge or like is this the most just thing we could possibly be doing um, and without 
any attachment or fear. I think that's one of the things I learned at, at the divinity school to just ask, asking the questions is like most of it, honestly. Um, and so when I'm sitting in, in classes with Dean Towns um, or Dr. Shepard or, I mean, really anybody. <laughs> and I'm just like, is this the most just way we can tell this story? I'm um, just the practice of that. And then the support to find that answer um, was a really critical skill that I use all the time. I think people are annoyed because they're like, HR has rules, Sarah. And I look at them like, really though? Do they? Uh, which leads me to my third point, which is um, at the Divinity School, I came to think of myself as a laborer in a different way um, with, a, with theology, with a theology, namely like womanist theology to ground how I navigate my worth in the workplace and how I set boundaries as a minister and who I'm ministering to and who I'm not based on what I thought I was signing up for and how those shift and change. Um, because ministry is complicated and we're asked to do a variety of things that may or may not have been what we signed up for. Um, so having a theological grounding of like, actually, um, this is my analysis on labor, <laughs> theologically grounded. This is my analysis on like what it means to be um, a black woman laboring with and for white people. Um, critical. Uh, and I think I, I can credit the divinity school with um, the language and the confidence to not only have the thoughts, but invite others into the conversation. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, definitely want to affirm all the stuff my colleagues just said. Uh, those are all very important things I also learned, uh, particularly what Tara said about um, deconstructing problematic uh, theologies that, that are really hurtful to other people. Um, for me, as a white heterosexual cisgender male, um, that's been very important for me uh, because you know society tends to defer to people who look like me a lot. Um, so I had opportunities to unpack my privilege and, and really explore that in ways I never had before, and, and I'm still on that journey very much so. Um, the biggest benefit, though, I would say is that, um, so I graduated in 2007. Uh, I went from Vanderbilt in Nashville, nice blue dot in a sea of red, uh, to a very rural United Methodist congregation near Clarksville, Tennessee, which is right, yeah, exact, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> which is right by Fort Campbell the gigantic military base. And at that time, war was very much at its height and every single family in that congregation had a dad, brother, son, somebody overseas. So I very quickly had to learn a whole new language if I was still gonna talk about these issues of justice and peace building. Um, you know, you could, you know, Bush was a four letter word at Vanderbilt at that time, very much so. Uh, and then go to a place where all people, if even if they didn't necessarily like him all that much, were still on you know the team. Um, I was fortunate to have had experience in field education, where Vicki Matson uh, really helped us learn how to be learners on the fly, uh, to really take in context around us, decode uh, certain phrases that may mean one thing in Nashville, another thing in Clarksville, um, and also in in uh, homiletics classes uh, where Dr. McClure. Uh, helped us understand the way people play different language games. Uh, you know, we we're both speaking English, a little different accents, uh, but the language was very, very different. And so because of my educational experience, um, I was much more able to navigate uh, that, that new system that I was suddenly in. I'm not going to say it was perfect. I still put my foot in my mouth a bunch. I still do today and I'm almost 40. Uh, but it, it, it made, it made it to where I could really, I was able to succeed, uh, in ministry in that community in a way that I would not have, uh, without those educational experiences at Vanderbilt. Thank you. Um, 
I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your education at Vanderbilt failed to prepare you or left big gaps because we're keeping it real over here. Did you have something in mind, Matt, or is, am I good to go? Go for it. Okay. Um, I was going to continue that thought about rural communities. <laughs> um, so I remember, yeah, I just feel ill-equipped <laughs> to, to think about rural ministry in rural areas. Um, and that's one thing I wish I could have maneuvered into the program, um, which honestly, I don't even know if I was all that focused on until it was like November 2016 and I was about to graduate. And then that thing happened and then they were kind of like, okay, have fun. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, so I, and, and so here we are four years later and honestly, we haven't done anything. So I, 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 for the sake of like our, my communities of color, the queer communities that I'm a part of, um, I wish I was better equipped to have those conversations. Um, and and learning on the go, I have found a place in a rural community as a foster parent. And um, the only thing I could think to do um, was to show up to the foster parent class and then ask for all of the queer and trans kids in the county's neighboring. Um, I only have one now, unfortunately. But I hear so many stories of kids who are in homes that are not I mean, they're just atrocious. So I wish I had more um, skills to be able to, it's not, and it's not the theological language and it's not the arguments, it's something different. And, and I still, you know, four years later, don't have what it is that it's missing. I can talk about the stories. I can talk about um, the problematic theology, but that's, it doesn't feel sufficient in rural communities um and i wish sitting here today that i had more of a handle on that um sarah can i piggyback on that a little bit um yeah i i agree there's i don't know there's much that can fully prepare you for rural communities because they're their own animal <laughs> um in, similarly i will say that i feel like at vanderbilt um I was going in for an MDiv uh, to be a, a congregational pastor, um, which I'm, I'm not doing now, but is, you know, was my vocational focus at the time. And I was lucky to have uh, professors like Bishop Pennell, who spent many, many years uh, in the parish, uh, people like Dr. McClure, who before they uh, did their academic work were, were parish ministers. Um, but I don't feel like there was as much or sufficient amount of focus for people that were going to be going into congregations uh, to try to learn and, and do ministry and justice work amidst people who were not as, um, let's say, ideologically pure as, uh, as we value at Vanderbilt. Um, again, I, I was lucky to have, you know, uh, through my own field ed placement at the time, uh, I was serving as youth minister in church at the time, uh, certain other professors who helped supplement that, but the culture of Overall, I think maybe value that uh, as much as other um, other venues of of ministry and justice work and chaplaincy and things like that. I want to jump in there one more time before Tara, because something that I learned from Tara at the end of my time that I was like, oh yeah, we didn't learn about that administration. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I you know I was coming right up that alley. You already I didn't know. I didn't know if you were going to go there or somewhere else, so I figured just say it, but um, that is something that is just a huge um, gap. That people know. It's not like I'm telling, I'm like exposing a secret, but um, there's like church finances that I don't have a good handle on. Um, there's like complex budgeting things, but there's also like um, HR things, like how to supervise people. Um, 
those are the those are the things that I was like, oh dang, Tara's over here writing a whole paper on it. Shoot. <laughs> So. To say nothing of unclogging choi- uh, unclogging toilets and van repair and <laughs> yeah, yeah um, so I, I didn't I didn't particularly like this question because I don't like the word fail. I don't feel like the divinity program failed me. Like it didn't fail me. I mean, I paid eighty thousand dollars for it. It did not fail me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, financially, it may have failed me, but it didn't fail me um, education-wise, honestly. Um, and I sat with this question a long time thinking about it. And I just, I, I struggle with the word fail. But I agree with my counterparts, Matt and Sarah. And Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that I don't know you, but I'm looking forward to getting to know you now that the connection has been made. We need to hang out, um, yeah, definitely. But um, there, there are components that I wished had been offered in and through the program. And I realized that, um, you know, you're there for a slim amount of time, but maybe it's in partnership with other folks that they can give you resources to go and learn these things, whether they're, you know, through lunch and learns, or maybe the Owen is doing some of this, or the law school is doing some of this, and there are lunch and learn opportunities where we can jump over and go to their things, or, you know, those kinds of things. But I think they're right. There were lots of gaps in the administration piece of ministry, period, wherever you are, because administration happens whether I'm sitting at my desk at Vanderbilt all day long or whether I'm I'm in a church doing whatever or I'm in a nonprofit doing whatever the administration piece has to live and breathe um, and so understanding the financial piece um, you know we get a little bit of that because we're dealing with our student loans and how to keep our debt down and that kind of thing but it's <clears throat> excuse me it's different when you're obligated to a, uh, an organization of some sort about the finances that are happening. Um, and so that could be developed a little bit. And the leadership classes, when I first got there, there was a wonderful man there. He was a United Methodist, can't remember his name now, and he did offer some leadership and conflict resolution stuff, but I think he was there maybe on some sort of grant. Um, and so he was only there one semester and I crammed everything I could into that semester. Oh, Tom um, Lenny? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great guy. Yes. Yes. So I don't know if there's some kind of way to get in partnership with some folks like that who can help us through, you know, the leadership piece. How do you manage people? How do you be the church and discipline folks? Um, because discipline has to happen, right? Um, it got, got, it's God's grace. It's not our grace. We are an extension of it. But we have to be able to say to people, no, you messed up. And this is a warning. And the next time you do this, you're not going to be here anymore um, because we are the church. And we have to be able to say that to pastors, to deacons, to elders, to congregants. Across the board, we have to be able to say that. We have to be able to say it with love, but we have to be able to say it. And so who helps us navigate that and to learn that thing? And then conflict resolution, right? There are systems that play. And again, Tom touched on this. Um, but how do you learn those systems that are at play and how to navigate them and manage them? Because when we go into pastor, um, I did that for 18 months uh, right out of grad school. I went to pastor congregation um, and there were so many systems at play that I just didn't really understand how to manage. Um, and so I was having to read, but I was behind the eight ball. Um, trying to get ahead of it. And um, so that there's just that piece that's missing. Um, now, indirectly, I think we do gain those experiences, right? Because you have conflict with your colleagues as we're, as we say, debating <laughs> a thing that we believe. Um, but there's some conflict resolution that's happening in the midst of that because we get angry trying to defend our point. And so how do you minimize that to say, you know what, both and or either or, or let's see how we can live and breathe together in this thing. Um, and so I think indirectly we gain some of those expenses again with the finance, with you know trying to finance our way through school. You indirectly get these things, but there's no time that we sit down um, and um, go through that. I know we're a divinity school, but I would have also um, appreciated seeing that biblically modeled, right? So I think that there's ways that that we could have brought in the Bible to biblically model how some of these things played out in the Bible. Um, since we didn't have classes that were directly related to that. But the Bible, I think, walks us through some of that, um, you know, also with the Matthew text. Um, but overall, um, the divinity experience was a good one. Um, we can always find flaws or things that we would like to see done better or different or what have you. But um, it's, I believe it's also about what you bring to the table. Um, and if you bring your whole total self, 
um, Sarah, you know, I think in that last class that we had together, we saw that kind of manifest in a way. Um, so shout out to Stacy Floyd Thomas. If you can grab a class, grab a class. Um, because um, the chatter of the walls sometimes will keep you from taking folks, but there are some folks in that building that if you can get in their space and get in their in their classes, that they do this work without calling it a finance class or a leadership class or a conflict resolution class, but it just kind of happens naturally. Um, so um, don't be afraid, I think would be something that I would add um, to something that I would have known before I went to divinity school. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, just jump in and do it. And um, you're gonna be blessed because you took the risk um, of, of doing it, honestly. Can I add one more thing while, yep. yeah. I mean, these are not, yeah, I agree with Tara that I, it's not really a failing. It's just like things you might wanna account for that, that you're not maybe gonna get without a little digging. Um, writing. Uh, there are lots of people who got to that last, yes. like last class, that senior seminar, and were told that they did not know how to write, which I think is maybe like true, maybe not true. I don't know, but um, true for me, it's true for you. I think I was faking it till I made it. Um, but there's there's resources, and that's this is all about working the resources, the writing center. Um, I'm sure there are others, but writing is something that is presumed that we come into with but I my undergrad degree is in dance so um if you have a degree undergrad degree or if you've been out of school for a while I think that would be something to pay attention to I, I'd agree with that to a certain extent um except to say that the the type of writing that you do at Vanderbilt is really unique um academic writing itself is a is its own thing uh, but especially in the theology world is it's its own. So you can, you could be somebody that could sit down and write a great um, newspaper column and not quite know how it works in the div school world. Uh, and that's just, you, you sort of have to uh, absorb that uh, as time goes on. Um, I had to, I did a doctor of ministry a number of years after I graduated divinity school. I had to, to shift gears back into that mode and dissertation writing is, yeah, it's something else. Uh, but it, it, it's like it's like the MDiv final project on steroids. Um, but the, it there's some. Uh, but then I had to you know re reshift into the world of writing for normal people that didn't have PhDs. Um, so it's just it, it's it's just its own different thing, and you gotta. I think you can give yourself a little grace, honestly, because um, there's very little that can prepare you for that. And yeah, definitely use the writing center. Thank you all so much. This has been awesome. It's been really nice to get to know all of you better. I'm going to stop the recording.